Welcome to the underground, the Steel City Underground, a Pittsburgh Steelers podcast made by fans like you, for fans like you. Now, here's your host, Joe Kuzma. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Steel City Underground podcast. I am your host, Joe Kuzma. I think, folks, I think for all of you regular listeners, you can tell when I'm kind of geeked up and excited or I get something like underneath my skin. And today is one of those days I might just fly all over the place in this show with no real agenda. I want to talk about this Jets game that we just played on Sunday Maybe the Bumblebee jerseys retired forever. The Roonies are so tight-lipped about that. I think they really, really like those jerseys. I know I like those jerseys. I was wearing one, my Antonio Brown 80th 80th anniversary edition, Antonio Brown Bumblebee prison stripe, whatever you want to call it, 1933 throwback jersey, as the team did on Sunday. You know, I was talking to one of my writers here on SteelCityUnderground.com, Brian Roach, who's always giving us the great and witty and just energetic previews and reviews, the good, bad, and ugly, as you might see from time to time on the site. Brian and I are talking, and I said, you know, I always have to wear the jersey that the Steelers wear that particular day. If they're wearing the Bumblebees, I need to wear the Bumblebees. If they're away and wearing a white jersey, I have to wear the white away jersey. If they're at home, I have to wear the black jersey. And when I'm usually at these games, I I do the same thing. I do it whether I'm there, whether I'm at home. I have to have a jersey on. Some of my jerseys are new. Some of my jerseys are old. My cousin is vehemently against wearing old player jerseys. But, hey, you know what? I still got Heath Miller in the closet. I still got Troy. I'm going to wear those from time to time. My Heinz Ward is finally maybe retired. I have so many Ben Roethlisberger jerseys, I had to stop wearing a few of those, too. They just take the wear and tear. So just a little bit interesting side story there. The Bumblebees, I'm not sure if they're going to be back or not. But like I said, man, it's been a while since I got to talk to you guys. I was really geeked up about this. Um, You know, I I get out there, I tailgate. This this whole thing of just going to a game is a full-day operation for me because we just party hard, like, as far as tailgating. And I don't mean I get, like, sloppy, you know what, throw up on yourself drunk or anything like that, but I have a few adult beverages. And and having those at, like, 9, 10 in the morning and up to 1, I mean – up till that till game time because then when I'm at the game I don't really like drinking and if I do you know I spend a small fortune on uh, maybe not the best of choice of beer a big craft beer guy here myself I like my variety of styles as opposed to the water beer that are the official sponsors of the NFL although the cans are really cool and you know those will tide you by if you're trying to buzz buzz or whatever I don't want to offend anyone it might be trust me trust me we're not drinking and driving or doing anything crazy liquor is totally almost usually out of the question unless I want to fight someone so maybe a Ravens game or if I see a Patriots fan like I did a a guy in a Tom Brady jersey in this in the tailgate lot on Sunday are you are you kidding me I saw another guy with a full Carolina Panthers get up I, I know that you like your NFL teams but I've been to other NFL games where the Steelers haven't played I'm not gonna wear my Steelers stuff to those games as much as I I like the Steelers just because out of respect to both teams that are playing, not only just that home team. It just looks so stupid, especially, especially I, I've seen people like wear like a Steelers shirt with a Kansas City Chiefs hat or something like that. No, it wasn't the pet past uh, week with Sunday Night Football, but still stupid nonetheless. I mean, it just that type of stuff just gets under my skin. See, under my skin, but the real under my skin was I wanted to I wanted to come home from that game. Like I said, it's a it's a whole day long thing. We leave it like you know. 7.38 in the morning, then by the time you get through traffic and you get home and it's after 6 and I'm still watching some football, I'm playing the DraftKings, I'm in Yahoo Fantasy Football League, several of those. Um, I have interest in almost every game that's played. I, I like watching uh, the NFL in general. I, I even watched like the Monday night game that was it wasn't all that great, but I feel good for that kicker though. And for those of you who follow uh, and you go to the website each day, there's the daily Steelers grind, and we try and 
cultivate some of the like these cool posts that come across on Twitter every now and then Facebook, but Facebook's just so hard to like integrate into the website. And the, of course, YouTube videos or Instagram, we get some of those things too from time to time. And we put them in a daily post, the best of each day, or, or it's like almost like a day later, like that John Oliver show on HBO. Uh, but anyways, it's it's things you may have missed on, on social media. And you got this Aguayo, the, I'm trying to think of his full name, but he's the kicker that they took in the second round at Tampa Bay, and he misses two field goals in this game. He's been missing field goals in the preseason and extra points, and uh, and the regular season too, struggling so far. And then it comes down to him, and he has to kick it. It's almost like this is like WWE, and it's uh, or 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 like a soap opera, and it's scripted, and and you know, like the, this is the outcome sometimes with these NFL games. But what a great story for that kid to. You know, that was a lot of pressure, and they had these cameras like right up in his face. So, and then of course, you have as far as the um, that kicking that you have Odell Beckham making up with that too. So, these are things you catch if you're watching Sunday and Monday night football and, and, and Thursday night games, and it's a lot of fun. I, I have to I have to watch everything. So, Sunday was kind of a wash for me. I was kind of wore out. It was all day long process. I hadn't been getting sleep anyway because my kid had been sick. So, Monday was wiped out, didn't have time to record. So, of course, I tried to get this done. On Tuesday morning for everybody. So, you, you know, I, I don't want to be talking about the Jets game on like Thursday or Friday saying, hey, remember that Jets game? You guys probably heard anything and everything. So I try to make this a little more fresh. But I'll tell you what, this this computer of mine is just like it forced these updates on me. It took over an hour and I lost all the time that I had, the free time I had getting up early in the morning to try and record. So any apologies for some large gaps in between the shows? It's been a combination of just schedule, uh, family, uh, family's always first, of course. So, uh, I, I feel you guys are like my second family and I try to take care of you. So a little bit of apologies there because I really pride myself on trying to get you about two or three shows per week. If I could do more, I would do more. It's just a matter of just time and sometimes guests and, and everybody that works with me and has been a guest on the show understands how quirky I get at times with that too. But actually going to these games, I mean, it's like, hey, you know what? I got a real life. I go to these games. I, I'm not as lucky to be on live radio and in a press box or anything like that. You never know. Maybe someday. Maybe someday. But uh, this Jets game, I mean, we were so worried about this going in. I know we're worried about the whole Miami trip too, the longest trip the Steelers are going to make uh, this regular season anyways. I do expect some postseason now that we are atop the AFC, not only the North, but the entire conference with the Oakland Raiders. Who would have thought the Oakland Raiders leading in their division now because the Broncos lose? And I put out an article about the power rankings and Oakland's like 10th and the Steelers are 7th and they, and they got like the Patriots and Broncos ranked ahead and this um, Elliot Harrison and, and nothing against him. I understand where he's coming from and he's got bosses to please and stuff like that but come on man. You're you're looking ahead at this Dolphins game and thinking that the Steelers drop games like, the, like these, these so-called trap games which would, you know, Mike Tomlin, the, the whole Pittsburgh Steelers staff, top to bottom, players, coaches, I don't I don't care, equipment manager, they do not believe in this trap thing. We talked about it on the last show with the round table with Jeff Hartman and Neil Kulong. And like I said, I hate to use the word. It's almost as bad as saying camp body. There's certain words I don't like to say. They almost have a negative connotation. And talking with one of my writers, Terry Fletcher, she was saying uh, how that was pinned to the page. And I said, well, it was kind of just an intro to what Brian had wrote uh, for the preview of that Jets game as to whether or not it could be de- defined as a trap game. And he explained why it was not by definition or just looking up, you know, Merriam-Webster's dictionary and saying this is what falls under a trap game. So, the but we were concerned about this Jets game. We were concerned about the offensive line. We were concerned about losing Marcus Gilbert as a right tackle and his backup, his backup. And sh- I was so shocked. Ryan Harris goes on the IR to too. And I understand they have to make these moves because they only had like 36, um, 36 players that were healthy. And I do believe it's uh, 46 players for the active ro- game day roster. So even though you have 52 or 53 on the roster, there are several players that are just – you got your inactives. Well, they, they, they didn't even need an inactive list because everybody was hurt. There were so many guys that were just ruled out that they really didn't even need it in an active list. So they had to call up um, Al Shabazz and Filer as uh, from the practice squad in order to fill some roles. Of course, Shabazz uh, playing as a corner, and Filer, I think, is a backup guard and or tackle or just an auxiliary-type offensive lineman. But 
I put the Steelers in the position where we were talking about with Marquise Pouncey taking snaps at right tackle in an emergency type case. And I talked to Ron Lippock of the uh, Pittsburgh Sports Daily Bulletin, and, and, and he made a very good point about how the Steelers aren't going to weaken two positions just to patch the line. So, of course, they, they were going to roll with Chris Hubbard uh, as the right tackle. And everybody has these pro football focus numbers, and he had like one of the worst preseasons ever, and he's a guard. and. Uh, I think he was quoted as somebody asking him before this game if he plays tackle, and he was trying to remember, yeah, I played it in college or something like that. And then he comes out of this game having played one of the best, if not the best and the highest graded of PFFs, uh, Steelers offensive lineman performances of the year in the high 80s somewhere. Uh, you know what? I might actually have that somewhere. Uh, yeah, he had an 89.6, and they said that um, – yeah, of course, he didn't allow a single pressure or sack, and you could see all the time that Ben had there in the pocket, and that's exactly what we said needed to happen. Now, of course, the Steelers were pitching in and helping him. Uh, you had like, Lev Bell out there, D'Angelo Williams, uh, Jesse James, Xavier Grimble, David Johnson, all these guys are pitching in on the right side, but not every single time. And I thought this offensive line held very well. I think there were only four real pressures on Ben out of uh, maybe about 48 pass attempts. And he he only got pressured four times, and he only got hit once, one sack, one sack the entire time. So Ben Roethlisberger, against what's supposed to be a good Jets defensive front at least, because I had spoken about how their secondary was not really up the par, and then they lost their uh, one inside linebacker, I think, in the third quarter, and now it's basically like the equivalent of when we lost Shazier in that Eagles game. And Delrell Rivas was already uh, ruled out, so they were playing with Buster Screen and another young man. I, I want to say it was uh, Roberts was his last name as the other corner. And it, it just – Ben tore him apart, okay? Uh, Roethlisberger is off to one heck of a start this season. His numbers are just uh, jumping off the page. He was 34-47 for uh, with a 72.3% completion rate, completing those 34 passes, 380 yards, just took the one sack for eight yards, and four touchdown passes, no interceptions, 124.4 quarterback rating. Wow. It's just wow. And, and then I also spoke about how Le'Veon Bell is probably the second best wide receiver on this Steelers unit. There's going to be an article up on SteelCityUnderground.com about that. And plus all of these stats. There, there are a number of statistics that are just popping off the page for these Steelers. Ben holds so many franchise records now. He has the most touchdown passes in the first five games of the season with 15. He's extended his franchise record of games with four or more touchdown passes in a game to 12 games. He has a team record of 348 300 yard passing games. Uh, he's also tied an NFL record for the most consecutive 15 TD pass seasons to begin an NFL career. That would be 13 consecutive 15 TD pass seasons. That ties the great Peyton Manning. I could say great Peyton Manning because it's a guy I respect. I remember I was joking with some guys walking into Heinz Field right before this Chiefs game. Two guys that had Tony Gonzalez jerseys, and we were kind of ribbing them. Hey, didn't he go to Atlanta, blah, blah, blah. And they say he's the greatest tight end who ever played. And arguably, yes. Yes, he is. It's, there are certain players that just transcend fandom that you uh, look at on other teams and you just, you just respect for the way they play and what they did in the NFL. And I say Tony is one of those guys just as much as Peyton Manning. Well, I mentioned Peyton Manning to them, and of course the Broncos having played in the same division, the AFC West, uh, they weren't too happy about that. Nah, screw Peyton Manning. Is what, well, they said something a little more vulgar than that because they you could tell they, were, they had a little bit to drink, more than I did. But anyway, I, I digress. For all the respect that Peyton Manning does have, Ben Roethlisberger is usually not thought of in that same category, but Ben is now on pace for 48 touchdown passes this season. He's never thrown more than 32 in a season, if my numbers here are correct. He is uh, he's basically Mr. October when he's playing at Heinz Field, too. He's 20-1 and one as a starter. He's only lost one regular season game. Well, they only play regular season games in October anyway. But that goes back as the best 
in NFL history by a quarterback since 1970, the merger point. And Roethlisberger has thrown at least three touchdown passes in six consecutive regular season home games. That goes back to November 15th of 2015. So... Along with that, Antonio Brown snuck in. Uh, he reached the 7,500 receiving yard mark in his career on Sunday, and he's the 10th active player that has reached that milestone. He broke a tie with the st- former Steeler Buddy Dial as the, for the fifth most touchdown catches in Steelers history with 43, and also his punt return put him in some good company with 1,600 plus punt return yards. Of course, Rod Woodson is number one all time with 2,362. And Antonio only needs 37 more to pass Antoine Randall L to jump into second place behind Rod Woodson, who may may maybe before Antonio Brown and, and even Ben may have been my uh, favorite stealer of all time because that's the era I grew up in. I loved Rod Woodson. And you you also have some other interesting statistics too. I mean, they're just piling up here. Uh, Jesse James is is scoring a a lot of touchdowns so far th- thus early in this season. Uh, he's catching up. He's right behind uh, Eric Green and Heath Miller's third most all time in team history for the first thirteen games of his career. Eric Green had seven, and Heath Miller had six through their first thirteen. James now has four. Before this uh, season's over, he could very well be on a record pace, and nobody, I, even myself, didn't expect this much from him. But, geez, man, was he so wide open. You're going to see that uh, if you guys are listening to this and it's not up yet. Uh, we have two features that are on every week now and provided by two of my teammates here at SCU, Zach C. I'm going to say C because Zach I don't know how to say your name. It's so long. I could Saurus or something like that. It does. It sounds like a dinosaur name. I'm going to have to ask you how to properly say that because I don't want to butcher it here on the show. You'll probably get a good chuckle when you hear this. I'm going to I'm going to hear it from him. That's okay. I always spell Eric's name wrong all the time too. H e double r m a double n. That's the only way I can remember it. You better believe it. So uh, Zach does the offensive breakdowns and. Um, I, I help put some of the film clips together there with him, and we break down the offense. And then, uh, of course, Josh Fitzer does the, the defensive breakdowns when Josh isn't swamped with his. He's got a baby coming, so it's more than understandable, Josh. But we got the offensive and defensive things down. We try to break down a little bit of film, not too much because we can't give away the whole game or else the NFL is going to slap us on the hands. But we, we pull out a few clips that we feel are necessary. And if that's sort of kind of your thing, we try and get something. And, uh, you know, the popular ones that are going to go up, we're going to have the Sammy Coates thing. But there's a, there's a Chris Hubbard thing in there, too. And we got to talk about this coaching staff because it, all these numbers that we're throwing around, all these things that are pretty impressive. Uh, I mean, Chris Hubbard's first start ever, and he has one of the highest grades. And uh, Ben Roethlisberger says on his show on Tuesday that he, you know, he didn't even notice that Chris Hubbard was there. And that's exactly kind of how you want it to be, right? Uh, really, I think Alejandro Ville and Nueva now, mind you, I watch the all twenty two, but I don't watch all the all twenty two. I kind of skip around because it's pretty it's pretty bland and dry. And uh, I didn't I didn't go back and look at this, but I think a Big Al was the one that uh, got beat for the sack in this game. So, uh, but it was all still only one sack. I mean that's that's very impressive. You're you're talking about a front front defensive line there for the Jets that's feared across the league. So. Uh, once again, Le'Veon Bell, the, not much uh, running on the ground, but he did have nine catches for 88 yards, and the Jets had been holding all all ga- all uh, opponents under 100 yards rushing. They have not given up a 100-yard rusher, and they still have not uh, thus far this season. So, And then you had uh, Sammy Coates. Sammy Coates just, uh, just breaking out. As Ben said, he had a great game but could have had a monster game. He had five drops, and PFF ended up rating him of 46.8 but then again we found out he had 17 stitches in his hand he had his hand was lacerated at halftime and that did happen during the game according to Mike Tomlin during his press conference so the coaching the coaching has been spectacular and I wonder if it's part of the system because where I was praising BJ Finney just a week earlier playing in Ramon Foster's spot coach Mike Munchak as far as an offensive lineman I don't ever want to see Munch leave this team 
I, I, I want to see him there forever. <laughs> and I like Mike Tomlin. And then you also have Todd Haley. So on the offensive side of the ball, you have, um, you have as far as the assistants, two former head coaches in the NFL that are prepping and getting this game plan together. And so that's why I feel trap games are kind of b- bizarre words and, and bogus. But just being able to plug someone like Finney or Hubbard in here is, is pretty amazing, if you ask me. Um, one of the people that were not liked by Pro Football Focus this week, uh, believe it or not, Chris Hubbard was one of the top 10 best offensive players of the week in the entire league, according to Pro Football Focus. I talk about Pro Football Focus a lot because they grade individual performances. I, I'm going to talk about Ross Cockrell, okay? He got one of the worst performances, and I don't think that was necessarily fair. He has three pass breakups in this game, uh, pretty much the only weapon, and one of the one of the great weapons in the NFL is Brandon Marshall. Remember, Brandon Marshall is the one who wanted to bet Antonio Brown, and he's probably one of the few players that could actually not only put something up uh, as far as stats comparable, maybe Julio Jones or somebody like that, but he's one of the few guys. And this is where Ross Cockrell, a guy, Drafted in the fourth round by Buffalo, cut by them the following year. Now a starter with the Pittsburgh Steelers is watching the wide receiver one of the New York Jets. Now, mind you, if the Jets have somebody other than Ryan Fitzpatrick be under center, maybe Brandon Marshall does a little better, but he had a heck of a year last year. And you know what? Brandon Marshall had a, a very good first half and was pretty much shut down. And the, the Jets were still in this game if you go through just uh, one half of football. Uh, you look at the scoring – and I'm going to pull it up here. Uh, and, of course, this thing is taking its time loading, as is usual. So Jets strike first. Uh, they end up, uh, what was it? Uh, they ended up, what, 7-3 or 7-6 after the whole Sammy uh, the Sammy Coates bomb. And Sammy Coates getting that low grade, too, I think is a little unfair. Now, he did have, those, he did have like two or three drops. I thought there was one that was a decent whatever coverage you're not going to get them all i mean we strive for perfection uh, that's what we want that that's the where the bar is set as fans but so do the players they strive for perfection too but asking for perfection i mean ben's not going to complete every pass and every pass is going to be thrown he's he, the passes were amazing and let me tell you sammy just a foot race just burns that other guy i see sammy the same way i see martavis bryant there is uh, there is some gro- there's growth there it's definitely on an upward trend he's getting better each week he's fighting for the ball he's making moves in the open field i saw a few things that i really really liked from him Zach pointed out the stiff arm that he had. I think it was a a first down he picked up, uh, maybe a third down play. I'm trying to remember, but it's basically set up a touchdown, the the touchdown a few plays later, I think, that went to Jesse James. And how about that play? Ben Roethlisberger calls his shot. Like, he's Babe Ruth, points at Antonio Brown, and the Jets bite on it and double cover Antonio Brown, and nobody covers Jesse James in the end zone. He's so ridiculously wide open. I mean, Everybody remembers – you remember that if you saw it on Sunday, but if you watch it again, you still can't believe how wide open he was there. But that all transpires because Sammy Coates ends up making that play. And then and then the next one that Sammy Coates makes is the one where the Jets jump offside. And Ben, who's he look to? And i um, trying to think who else was open. There was somebody else open. But everybody knows as soon as you see that, that flag thrown by the referee and Ben Roethlisberger has that ball – in his hands at free play. We know it's going downfield, and Sammy redeems himself with a solid catch. I mean, it was it was near the sidelines. It was put where only he could get it, and uh, just, just a very nice play by all involved, and that led to the Antonio Brown touchdown as well, and if you end up watching some of that on the film, that will be up. You'll see that Le'Veon Bell uh, comes along the right edge to maybe chip someone, and he, he just it's kind of one of those like um, a chip in release where he's going to go out for for uh, the pass. And Bell doesn't even have to chip anyone because Hubbard is just taking care of business. So just a fantastic coaching job done by this entire team and to come out in that second half, which I'll attribute even the two-minute drill at the end of the first half, 
I'm going to attribute some of this to, I, I'm going to go back to deferring on the coin toss, which apparently in, in the post game, uh, when they're talking to Ben, I think in the locker room or it was just the, uh, the post game press conference deal. Uh, one of those things they, they asked Ben about the coin. I'm glad somebody asked him about the coin toss. Cause some people are more worried about whether or not Ryan Shazier is, should be playing a different position, which is nonsense. I'm sick of the calls and, and somebody who gets to sit in this room with a press credential and actually ask that question is beyond me. It's so silly but uh yeah well let's have somebody play a position they'd never played in their life right but ben uh mike tomlin has empowered ben roethlisberger with the decision of whether or not they should receive or defer and they've been deferring and ben had mentioned and this is the same conservative playbook that i grew up with that i like when you can score at the end of the first half and get the ball to start the second half and then Pour it on some more. That puts the other team in a very tight spot. Now, it didn't necessarily work out exactly that way, but it doesn't every time. But that's the school of thought that I like because if you could shut down somebody, especially at home, on the on the very first possession of the game and not let allow that opponent who gets the ball first to actually do anything with it, I think that's a feather in your cap. And then when you could demoralize a team coming out from halftime and score after, maybe you put up some points and chew the clock at the end of the first half, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. So it's good. different situations are going to dictate different things because if a team has like a weak defense, you might see the the Steelers go right after the Miami Dolphins first thing. Go go straight after them this week. I, I'm not the biggest fan of that, but you know what? If they get the ball to start the second half, and that trust me, that stadium in Miami, uh, my buddy Matt and Steelers Nation South, they're they're going to be rocking down there. A huge tailgate party. So check out Matt and his stuff too. But they're going to. It's going to be a Steelers home game just in uh, S- Southern Florida there, and. Hard Rock Stadium, it's going to be filled with Steelers fans. Normally, I would say if it's an away game and they're getting the ball to start the second half, all the more power to them because what ends up happening in Heinz Field, too, is is all these people have been eating and drinking and they've been waiting in order to, to take their bathroom break. And not everybody gets to their seats to start the third quarter. So if you end up uh, giving the other team the ball, you win the toss and you decide you want it first and you give the other team, like the Jets, the ball to start the second half – the beginning of that third quarter, they have no crowd noise, and they can pretty much do uh, – they can move the ball, and it's it's an easy way. We've seen it multiple times where teams just go straight down the field and score uh, maybe a hurry up or whatever it is because they don't have to deal with the crowd, and that kind of takes away the home field advantage. So uh, likewise, if you have the chance to maybe um, – get the ball first in the second half as an away team, that also plays into your favor. So I'm not going to say that all the time you should always defer, but you see where it is an advantage or whatnot. But Ross Cockrell, okay. Ross Cockrell nearly had a pick, and what a fluke that Brandon Marshall ends up with that ball. And they end up making that part of that. But he had a few pass defenses there. And I think Brandon Marshall only has two catches, uh, one in the third quarter and one in the fourth quarter, if I recall correctly. And one was a little uh, deeper. It was a a little uh, crossing route where he came from one side of the field all the way to the other. And Cockrell kind of trailed him there with some safety help. And he was open. But if you saw how far off the ball these guys were playing by this point, the, the thing we always complain about with the Steelers' DBs, how far off the ball they're playing. I can't really necessarily uh, fault Ross Cockrell for that play, but they I think they shut down the Jets' offense entirely. Not quite sure why the Jets were doing nothing with Matt Forte. He totally chewed up the Steelers with the Bears a few years ago on a Sunday night football game. It seemed like he just disappeared from the picture entirely, and so did Brandon Marshall. And, of course, some of that was the pressure being put on Fitzpatrick. Did not get a turnover in this game, and even the turnover that the Steelers gave. The Steelers could have scored some more points and padded their average. Uh, just a, just kind of a fluky uh, whatever kind of balls hit, punched out from the back of Ben Roethlisberger and into the oncoming arms of a defensive lineman. So... You don't get a turnover in this game, but I'm not too. Uh, I'm not going to obsess over it because the Steelers' defense once again had a very good day, especially their third down uh, efficiency. They held the Jets to two out of eleven tries for eighteen percent on third down. They're probably a top five D right now. If I were to look at it, they were already trending pretty high. That 
that's what we've been wanting all year. Uh, from last year, they had a problem getting off the field on third down. There might be some chunks on first or second, but the Steelers are getting off the field, and the offense is uh, usually winning in time of possession as well. And they did so again in this game with 31 and a half, almost 32 full minutes here, 31.50 to 28.10 that the Jets had in this 31 to 13 final. Don't forget. So we talked about the coin toss. We talked about Ross Cockrell. We talked about Sammy Coates. We talked about Bell being the second best receiver. Let's talk about Ben Roethlisberger again, leading all of the NFL quarterbacks with 15 touchdown passes. And he has three plus TD passes in his last few games. Uh, Also on the defensive side of the ball, I wanted to talk about, I want to talk about Jarvis Jones because I know a lot of people just they're not necessarily thinking that Jarvis Jones lives up to his first uh, first round billing. I know he's in a contract year. I know they didn't pick up the option on him. But you know what? He has been a very solid player for this team. He gets the pressure in there. You see him tip a pass again. He nearly had another interception. He does get in, and he he had some really fantastic plays. There was one where he he basically crushes a, a Jets run play on third down, forces them to punt. Jar, um, oh, you know what that was? That wasn't that was wasn't necessarily it either. He he. Well, no, it was. Um, Arthur Motes is in the rotation with James Harrison. I'm thinking of another play where James Harrison was held <laughs> badly, and the flags came flying out. And Fitzpatrick moves up into the pocket into the waiting arms of Don't Cross the Motes and Lawrence Timmons both there as probably probably wasn't the best choice for Fitzpatrick. But the Steelers gaining pressure. I thought Jarvis Jones had another excellent game. We saw Anthony Chikillo playing in that rotation with Jarvis. Jarvis is playing in James Harrison's spot as part of that rotation on the right. Um, Chiquillo on the other side comes in, has a strip sack, is very reminiscent to him almost being unblocked, except this time he wasn't unblocked. He he makes a move, dips. Fitzpatrick takes uh, several steps back into that pocket, and he and, – and Chick is just right there ready to hit him. So nearly forces a turnover there. This is more of what we want to see from the Steelers' defense. Uh, In fact, the Jets' first half drives went a little like this. It was a field goal, punt, field goal, touchdown, end of half. The second half, much better. Punt, 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 and turnover on downs. Wow. Very, very good. So we were a bit concerned. I think the Steelers were a bit concerned in this game, too. If you remember early on, third and 15, they just let Le'Veon Bell run the ball on like a halfback draw that got nowhere. I think they were a little concerned about Chris Hubbard. They were concerned if they turned the ball over or threw it. They were just trying to get some positive yards with punting. And let me tell you, Jordan Berry has been just phenomenal this season. Three of his punts land inside. All three of his punts in this game land inside within the 20-yard line. He's a weapon. He helps the defense. Just the fake field goal thing, not very good. But like we said before, uh, you look like a genius when it works. You look like an idiot when it doesn't. Special teams as well. Antonio Brown already mentioned, jumping into third all-time on the Steelers list. This is the reason why they have Antonio Brown returning punts. In fact, if Jesse, uh, it wasn't Jesse James. It was Jordan Dangerfield. If he's able to maintain that block for like an extra second or two, A.B. takes one to the house. So this is one of the things that happen. Uh, unfortunately, in this game, uh, even – you know, the defense missing starters, they did this even without Cam Hayward. Cam Hayward's going to probably be out for several weeks. Tomlin wouldn't confirm how long, and Hayward is on the record as saying he has mutant healing powers. So we want to see those in effect, Cam. We want to see you right back out there. If you're one of the X-Men, just ask the other X-Man, Xavier Grimble, how all that works. I don't know. And just kind of tongue-in-cheek there. Uh, another tongue-in-cheek thing as far as one of the bad things that happened in this Jets game. Probably the only intolerable thing was playing Renegade about two minutes left in the game. Everyone's already heading to the heading to their car. Uh, they feel the Steelers had it in hand. I know a lot of people think, how can that be? Well, people that have season tickets and go to every single game were kind of spoiled. And they're just thinking about the rest of their Sunday. They want to go home, see their family. I can understand it. They have to work. Uh, they were already there the week earlier. They were there for a late night Sunday, getting home late. Like myself, I had to take Monday off uh, just so I can uh, adjust my life 
life and get some sleep, get some rest, and take care of business at home. So uh, it took a little bit of spice out of the whole Renegade thing. We live streamed it, and you could see some of the empty seats, and it wasn't necessarily – I just didn't understand by that time the Steelers had the game in hand. Uh, maybe play it like a little bit earlier, like the third quarter or so, and it was still a little close. I always enjoy hearing Renegade, but we've had some games where they don't play it at all. We've had some games where they play it twice and kind of make up for it. They kind of like save one, you know. It's like almost like that Chiefs game, but that Chiefs game it was it was wild and raucous, and it's always fun getting Renegade when you know you have the game in hand, like the last two at Heinz. Hopefully, hopefully the next time we hear Renegade against the Patriots, we get sack Tom Brady. I can't wait to deflate Tom Brady, but I don't want to look ahead to that because it could be a trap in Miami, but I'm going to talk about that on the next show. So, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you. Thank you for those of you who have followed us on Twitter, have liked the Facebook page. I begged the last time. Somebody said I gave in to the begging, and I said, yes, it worked. So, if you're doing all that stuff, cool, great. Always always interact. Feel free to call the hotline, too. Um, we're still out there, 203-900-4SCU, if you have any comments that you want played on the show. But until next time... Be safe, be good, and I will catch you later. We would like to thank you for listening and remind our listeners to follow us on social media and our website, www.steelcityunderground.com. 